So hi guys, like this is, this is attempt number four to try to like record that. Every time I try like to record this, I start coughing and I have to stop. So I'm gonna have like to do this in phases. So anyway, bear with me. Normally when I start talking about this, what I actually uh, this this theme like parasitism, I open the lecture with a bang by showing this video on parasitism right here. And it's a very interesting video that shows how snails turn, are turning into zombies by a parasite. So I really want you guys to stop now and watch that video. Because if you do that, then I draw you into the subject. Like, so take a moment now and take a look at that video. So now that you guys watch that video, like, um, let's talk about parasitism right we we have like to define first like what is a parasite a parasite is anything that lives in or like on another organism in because some things are inside you and on because some other things are just attached clinging to your skin so this is the difference between something that is uh, a tick living outside with a parasite or a bacteria that is actually inside your body Either way, like regardless of the mode of attachment to their uh, organism, they all parasites will consume some of the host resources. The host is is whoever is whichever organism is harboring that parasite, right? And by consuming the host resources, they may eventually lead to death. Not necessarily, but they may eventually lead to death. So parasites are consuming the host resources and cause harm to the host right as they cause harm to their host like they can potentially be a pathogen a parasite that causes like an infectious disease right now we have an outbreak of covid19 which is an infectious disease is a is a parasite right um but they are powerful regulations of the abundance of the host species without parasites the community structure of the world would be completely different one of the things that would actually be different is that we would have you would have certain populations of certain animals exploding to the point that they would outcompete the other ones simply by being more abundant. So parasites are um, uh, an evil necessity, a dark necessity of this planet, if you may, right? Because they will control the abundance of species. Right? Of course, it's not fun when we actually have that parasite, but uh, they do play a role in the ecosystem, right? Broadly speaking, we can divide the parasites into two big categories, the so-called ectoparasites and the endoparasites. We already said that, like we just didn't give the names to that. We said they live inside or on the organism, and that's essentially what these two categories talk about. But it's more than just like their mode of attachment to the organism. They actually have different lifestyles, right? So uh, let's talk about the endoparasites, because then I talk about that, and everything I talk about the endoparasites, the ectoparasites are going to be the opposite of that. Endoparasites have an advantage in relation to uh, ectoparasites because they have a really low exposure to natural enemies. A tapeworm inside your gut is not exposed to anything except your immune system. There are no enemies that can potentially come and remove it. A tick, on the other hand, which is an ectoparasite, a tick is exposed to natural enemies. A bird can come and pick on that tick and relieve the animal, the host, from that parasite. Not only that, the external environment is more stable inside endoparasites. The body of an organ, the host, doesn't fluctuate as much as the environment itself for a tick, for instance, right? Knowing that, some animals that actually cope with the ectoparasites, right, that, that uh, know that the external environment is can be harsh on them, will take advantage of that. One good example of that is many animals that roll in the mud. The mud will actually dry out and eventually like rip out a part of the the, the body of the tick. The endoparasites have like uh, the advantage of being not exposed to natural enemies, not exposed to the external environment, but suffer like from uh, moving from one organism to the next one because they have difficulty of movement, a high difficulty of move, movement to hold to and from host. So in that sense, endoparasites like the struggle more than ectoparasites. Um, on top of this, they also have to cope with the host immune system. 
that can try to fight the, ectoparas the endoparasite off. A tick doesn't have to deal with that. As you start mounting a response against the tick, the tick can simply drop off and then move on. Um, as you mount a response against the, a virus, it doesn't have an option. You know, I mean, it can reproduce and go somewhere else, but that, that specific individual inside like, it has a difficulty moving from one host to the next one. But it is a lot easier to feed on the host if you're on the inside, right? There's no scratching, nothing that can actually flick off like the parasite out of the animal, right? And I cannot just scratch the bacteria away from my body. So for the bacteria, it's a lot easier to uh, consume my resources from the inside. So ectoparasites, right? They're mostly arthropods. Ticks, mites, louse, fleas are different examples of ectoparasites. But they can be leeches, lampreys, and even nematodes that live on the outside, right? Um, don't get things confused here, right? Because one clear definition of parasites is this, is that it has to consume some of your resources. If I get in your skin now and then get a sample of your skin, I would see that there are a bunch of bacteria living in your skin, and yet they are not parasites. They are not consuming any of the resources there, right? So an ectoparasite has to consume some of your resources, and they're not exclusive to be animals. Some plants, like this mistletoe right here, like is a type of ectoparasite. It clings to the outside of the trees and actually consumes some of the sap of that plant. Like you reduce the fitness of that tree. The tree is defoliated here not because the, the mistletoe like consume all the resources, uh, it can do so if there's a high infestation, but for the most part they don't, right? But mistletoes, like we, no we normally notice them on trees around the winter time. So back in the day, when people are trying like, to do arrangements for Christmas and they were trying to look for something green to look fun, they would look at the mistletoe and say, huh, let's do that. So it makes the tradition of kissing under the mistletoe very weird because it's like, let's kiss under the parasite. You know, nobody kisses under the tick, you know, um, but we do kiss under the mistletoe. So endoparasites can be divided in two major categories, the intracellular uh, guys and the intercellular endoparasites. What's the difference? The intracellular live inside the cells of a host. So they have to be specifically inside the cell. That doesn't mean that they have to be there in all times. They, but they need to be inside the cell to complete their life cycle. For instance, viruses, which are a type of intracellular uh, parasite, have to be inside the cell to complete their cycle. But they travel in the air. You know, me coughing right now, if I have a virus, I'm shedding some of those um, virus in the air, and they cannot survive on their own unless they eventually go inside the cell. So, the intercellular parasites live in spaces between cells of a host. Good examples of that are bacteria. Even though some bacteria, a small amount of bacteria, can be intra, some bacteria can be intracellular parasites, but the vast majority of them are intercellular parasites. So, and there's like fungi, helminths, and other things that can actually be. Uh, both actually. Fungi can be intra or intercellular parasites. I'm going to show an example of that shortly. So viruses, right? Viruses are not exclusive of, um, of, of animals. They can indeed affect some plants. This tobacco plant here has a mosaic, uh, mosaic like virus. There's no cure for that actually. The plant may actually his own um, uh, chemical resources to defend them against the viruses, but they cannot fully cure it, right? Once a plant gets infected by it, the only chance like for the, the farmer to combat that is by burning it. So viruses in plants cause actually a lot of losses for farmers, right? Because there's no cure for that. But viruses also cause a lot of losses for humanity because viruses are one of the most potent killers um, on this planet, right? So we have had like outbreaks of swine flu, bird flu, and now the COVID-19 like uh, spreading everywhere. And the humanity has gone like through um, many different type of vir viruses that are like have um, delivered a punch like to, to us, right? To say the least, right? Um, 
and they have a huge economic impact, right? So, all right. Prions, a different type of parasites, right? Um, and it's perhaps like a little bit like unfair to put them in the parasite category, but hey, these are things that actually are inside the host, right? Living up its resources and replicates. It doesn't fully like, uh, it's not fully like a, a, a living organism, but neither are viruses. Viruses are not considered to be um, living beings, but just replicating machines. And prions are actually just essentially that. A protein that folds into an incorrect shape and becomes pathogenic. Replicates, consumes some of the resources, and then as it touches other proteins, it infects that other protein, right? Mm, the, the greatest example of that is medical disease. A disease that was um, that occurred because some cows that had that, like the uh, had the prions, their bones were ground up and used to feed cows. Right, this is one of those really like distorted um, concepts of our society. You have a herbivorous animal like a cow being fed bone, being fed animals, right? And that created like the the spread of mad cow disease, and people would consume that cow meat and get mad cow disease, which would cause like encephalopathy, you know, make the brain like into a sponge. So. Um, Countries that were having that, those practices, specifically European countries, like have banned that practice now, uh, and we have, like, to a great extent, contained that spread of prions. Bacteria, right? If I'm going to um, say what are the, what is the greatest killer on this planet, um, bacteria comes in second place, and then I said second place because. Um, uh, the the there's like bacteriophages that actually there are bacteriophages that actually kill other bacteria. So this planet is a planet of bacteria. If there was some way like for me to do like Thanos and snap my fingers and uh, kill all living organisms on this planet except bacteria, on that snapshot, I should be able to see the outline of each organism because there's so many bacteria everywhere on this planet, right? I would see that outline, at least for that moment, right? If I could actually potentially visualize that, right? So plants suffer with like crown gall galls, shot holes like that are common in like in a plant here called laurels, right? And we also suffer with pneumonia, which is bacteria caused. It, it's amazing to me like how simply knowing the distinction between like uh, a bacteria and a virus can actually be helpful for you guys. Um, many of you already know, but like uh, some of you don't, that an antibiotic it just works for bacteria. It does not work for a virus. If you have a viral infection and the physician prescribes you antibiotics, you will do nothing for that because the medicine is specific to bacteria, right? A, a medicine that will kill viruses, viruses are called antivirals. They're completely different categories of medicine, and people misuse antibiotics all the time. So, fungi. Fungi cause like a lot of infections for us. We also are having like some fungi now that are becoming fungicide resistant, right? Um, and then becoming like a problem like in, in hospitals. But in the plant world, there are many plants that actually suffer with that as well. This street here in Detroit, Michigan, was lined up with all these beautiful uh, elms. The elms used to be the most common tree in the United States, right? And this Dutch elm disease, which is a fungus, came and wiped all of them out. And we had like to cut out all those trees out and replant them with something like uh, more resistant to that, right? Uh, right now we actually have like a, a Chinese hybrid of elms that is used widely in the nursery trade. We talk about this in vert bio, if you're not in vert bio, um, forgive me for that, but like we talk about these other type of fungi affecting frogs worldwide. Um, it's a mouthful of a name, but Trachochytrium dendrobatitis. Like, so it gets a bit rated just as chytrid fungus. Chytrid, right? Chytrid fungus, it's a, easier to say that. And dendrobatitis is just 
frog-like, right? So this fungus has caused like the killing of many organisms like in in the world. In fact, amphibians are there. The 33% of amphibians are th threatened with ex uh, extinction right now as a result of this fungus and other things. But this fungus is one of the leading causes, all right? And uh, if this sheds light into anything, you know, we can actually see how the spread of something like that, how can that curb the population, right? So this graph here will show you like uh, the survey of amphibians at like a site in Panama. And then we see like um, it's in log scale. So this is like on the thousands, right? Uh, so it's not like minus four frogs, it's like, but like thousands of frogs, right? Um, and their populations, like the species that were active at night showed in purple here. So these dots here show that, look at that, this actually, it starts good. When you were doing the surveys of these frogs, we actually figured out that the frogs were actually on the rise, somewhat. And then chytrid arrived there and there's a huge collapse. This is true for the species that are active at night and the species that are active during the day, right? So, and look, like the species active during the day probably were not like, like there's a little bit of a curve here, like, but the trend line is this one, right? They're also increasing and then collapse drastically, eliminating like 90%, like some, in some locations, like 95% of the frogs disappeared. So like, if you're a biologist walking through the forest, the sensation was that the, the forest went silent because you'd walk through the forest and you hear like the, the, the ribbits of frogs everywhere. And then out of a sudden like that disappears. So fungus can be like uh, a bad thing too. Helminths, which are more round worms and uh, flat worms. Like um, worms can cause like uh, diminish the 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 resources of the whole shoe. And there are many different types. We have hook worms, hook worms, like lung worms, tape worms, flukes. Like and there there's so many different types, right? But let's talk about like um, these specific. Um, uh, uh, helminth here, which is um, tapeworms, right? Tapeworms have like a very interesting life cycle. These guys actually depend like on uh, on having like more than one host to complete their life cycle. So the adults of these tapeworms, right? They are in your small intestine right here, right? And then the adults are like are like have like. Uh, a, a scolex at the front here that attaches the intestine and the many different segments here. Each one of these segments can break off and become like um, the next step on the life cycle of tapeworms, right? The segment that breaks off is called proglottitis, right? These eggs like on the feces, like uh, in the deposit in the environment, and then like something will consume that. Specifically pigs, we ingest like, the feces from humans and then once like these um, eggs or proglottitis um, are inside the fish, they actually go to a different type of, a different stage of their lives. They're called oncospheres, right? Oncospheres. So look it up, like um, uh, tapeworm, Google that later, tapeworm on uh, uh, on pigs, right? What it looks like, like, looks like. What it actually looks is that like when you actually get the pig, you see these little yellow spots on it, right? If you fully cook that pig, like you kill it, right? Uh, but people don't consume like fully cooked meat and then they would get that, right? These oncosphere that are inside the flesh of the pig gets consumed by a human and then the cycle starts again, right? Um, if you're lucky, you develop just tapeworm, but Alternatively, you can also develop cysticercosis, right? Is when like when uh, cysticercosis when actually uh, these like oncospheres that were formed in the pig are being formed in you, right? It's it can go to your lungs, right, and that's bad, but it can also go to your brain, right, and then like it's even worse. Okay, emerging infectious diseases. This is lecture comes like so handy now, like even the the the, the media. Uh, frames it now over COVID-19. Like for the longest time, epidemiologists, uh, let me put my face here again. Epidemiologists are talking about emerging infectious diseases. Uh, COVID-19 is just one of them, right? There are many different ones. Um, I really recommend you guys watching the movie Contagion to understand what actually is going on on the planet right now. 
here's what actually is happening. As we remove forest, we're getting closer contract with wildlife, right? And any parasite that is in wildlife has the potential to mutate and then move to us. Like we have had that with bird flu, swine flu, which are parasites that were in different hosts, birds and uh, pigs, that mutated and now can invade us, right? So uh, deforestation is highly linked to emerging infectious diseases. So if you didn't have enough reason like to preserve the forest, and now here's a good one, it will keep you healthy, right? So, um, and, but an emerging infectious disease is not like, exclusive to us. Some wildlife is also struggling with that. Like, let me disappear here for one second. Here's like a, a bat. Then you can see on the nose of that bat, that white fungus there. They named this the white nose bat syndrome. And it can actually cause havoc. But here's what actually is happening here. This is a very interesting scenario. This is a emerging infectious disease that is causing like, uh, that already existed, right? We had a strain of North American like, white fungus and the bats have co-evolved with that white fungus and they survive like mostly fine on this graph here i have like the the bats that have been exposed to that like how long do they last with the, the north american bats exposed to north american strain of that fungus how long do they last and yes like a good chunk of them start dying but they start dying like at day 1990 since exposure and then eventually like settle down like a 30 40 percent chance of surviving at the end of that right but when i get the european strain like the scenario is actually different the bats actually suffer like a much steeper decline if they get the imported one this is very similar to the disease that the european brought here like and then killed like a bunch of uh, native americans right and what happened the other way around too I mean, we know that like the european brought like um disease from europe to here and kill uh native americans but we also exported some syphilis is native to north america and got exported like to to europe and caused havoc there too All right, so moving on now um, this was a quick there was a clicker question there like i think i can quickly do that with you guys here um, parasites outside the native range are often uh, unable to find hosts, more deadly, mutate less frequently, unable to survive outside their hosts, right? Well, parasites, by definition, like, cannot survive outside their hosts for too long, right? And this sounds like, like a good option right here, right? However, um, this has nothing to do with being outside their native range. They cannot survive either way, so that is not a good option, right? Mutate less frequently. Uh, no, like if you put up viruses in Korea, Japan, um, Australia, United States, Brazil, it doesn't matter. Like it doesn't change the frequency of mutations for these viruses. No, no, right? Unable to find hosts. If option A was true, right? These like white fungus disease, like the European North strain of the fungus that moved to America would not have succeeded. It actually did the opposite. It was actually fairly good at actually finding the hosts, right? doesn't mean that it's better it doesn't mean that it's worse it's just the same you find the host the same way but outside their native range parasites will tend to be more deadly right that's what the previous graph just showed you it tends to be more deadly okay so parasites and host dynamics are determined by the parasite's ability to infect the host how good the parasite is at going from one uh, individual to the next is how good the parasite can survive, right? So, population of hosts and parasites will fluctuate over time. As a matter of fact, predators and prey fluctuate similarly to parasites, right? The lag phase is slightly like uh, reduced for parasites, depends on the, the generation time of each parasite, but they will fluctuate. If the parasite does not fluctuate the host, it will kill the entire population of the host and it drive itself to extinction. And that's usually no bueno for the parasite. The parasite wants to survive, right? So a, paras uh, 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 a parasite that proves to be too deadly also proves to be too short-lived, right? You do not want a parasite that like uh, that kills a bunch of hosts or kills it like promptly because that parasite will kill its most important and valuable resource, which is the host, right? So. Uh, evolutionary speaking, then, 
given enough time, parasites tend to not be too deadly. Or if they become too deadly, that gets selected against them. Imagine the same thing if a lion becomes too fast and it kills all the zebras. And then all of a sudden, like, there are no more zebras to eat and the lions will like fall down with the prey. So it's the same dynamics. So, but there are certain set of criteria that will influence the, uh, the probability of host infection, right? First of all is the mechanism of transmission, the mode of entering the host, the ability of a parasite to jump between species, and existence of reservoir species and counterattacks of the host immune system. So let's dissect each one of these uh, factors that affect the probability of host infection, right? The mechanism of parasite transmission. Like some mechanisms are better than other ones, right? Sometimes the parasite has to move on its own, right? From one host to the next one. Sometimes you will use uh, a vector, right? So in this case here, I have a vector right here, a mosquito, right? That is actually uh, working as a vector, right? Um, and that vector allow like for some a specific type of transmission that is known as horizontal transmission when it moves between individuals other than the parents and the offspring. Sometimes you can do it without a vector, but the vector does help. Why does the vector help? Because the bacteria that is actually uh, affecting this um, um, this bird right here, right? The bacteria, you know, the virus, right? The West Nile virus, like, cannot travel on its own, right? Here, out of a sudden, then, like, this virus hitchhikes on a flying organism, and it can travel much further, further distances, right? So, having like a vector will improve like the chances of transmission. Like, it can, it can improve the chances of transmission if the vector is very good at finding new potential hosts. So, um, I told you the most like deadly organism on this planet was. Uh, bacteriophage, the second most deadly one is uh, uh, bacteria. And among vertebrates, right, the deadliest uh, uh, thing that can affect us is actually mosquitoes, right? Um, in, in some people, like, when you talk about jungles, they're afraid of, like, uh, piranhas, snakes, and I'm way more afraid of mosquitoes because they carry a bunch of disease. So mosquitoes can allow like horizontal transmission, but it's not the only type of transmission we can have. We can also have vertical transmission. And vertical transmission is when a parasite is transmitted from the parent to its offspring. So far for the COVID-19, that has not been reported, right? But it can happen, right? HIV can be trans transferred like from mom to baby, right? So parasites and host dynamics are also affected by the modes of entering the host, right? Certain ways are better ones. We talked about, about like the reliance on a vector, right? But many times you don't have to that. The mode of entrance in the host is actually piercing the tissue. Like leeches, ticks, that's all they do, right? If they want to like get the host resources, they have to go pierce the, the tissue of, of the host. So caveats are, right? When I pierce the tissue of the host, the host may be aware of that and may try to scratch off like the parasite or bite into it, gnaw into that, like and see, prevent you from getting that. So the more subtle the bite, the easier it is. Mosquito bites are way more subtle, so the vectors like using like sometimes like can be more subtle. And then the bite of the parasite itself, right? So uh, the ability of the parasite to jump between species also determines like the parasite and host dynamics, right? If um, a parasite specific to to uh, to a certain species, right? can have a mutation, like acquires a mutation that allows you to explore a new species, that parasite becomes extremely success successful. HIV is a good example of that. HIV is derived from like uh, uh, another virus known as SIV. And the S there st stands for simian. Prim primates, that's what simian means, right? So uh, a type of like virus that affected monkeys and then through bush meat consumption, now we have HIV. Hmm. You notice a pattern here? Every time we actually like, start like doing like bush meat consumption, we start getting into trouble. Like it seems that the like, COVID-19 actually have jumped like from like bush meat, like pangolins or bats. I don't know yet which one, but like these wildlife came in contact with humans, and then uh, uh, badness is all around now. And then same thing for uh, HIV, right? It's not, it has nothing to do with like a human having sex with a monkey. You didn't have to have that. Like you just need to consume like raw meat of a monkey to get it, right? The other thing that affects like a parasite host dynamics is a reservoir of species. 
species that carry a parasite but do not succumb to the disease, right? They can be continuous source of parasites as host and, and other hosts and become rare. It, this is actually very interesting about the, the coronavirus now. There's a study done in 2000 um, in 2013, I think. I'm not going to remember the exact date, so don't quote me on that one, right? That had shown that like coronaviruses, like not the, this strain, not COVID-19, other strains of coronaviruses were widely prevalent um, in uh, the Chinese population, right? So the reason for that is because they are in close proximity with a reservoir species. Pangolins, bats are reservoir species of coronaviruses and eventually leap from one species to the next one. But it provides an endless supply of that virus and ample opportunity. So all we're doing is we're increasing the proximity of humans and wildlife and making the reservoir species be more effective at transmitting the, the viruses. Oh, the solution then is to eliminate all the bats. No, 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 right? So don't forget that bats eat mosquito shoe, right? So and everything is interconnected, right? So the solution is don't get close to them and don't destroy their habitat so you actually make like humanity more prone to that, right? And finally, the counterattacks of the host immune system are very important for uh, the parasite and host dynamics. If the host is very good at eliminating the virus or bacteria or whatever parasite it has, like you don't spread like that virus as much, right? Um, so this is actually very, very interesting, right? So uh, COVID-19 like doesn't kill that much percentage wise. I'm not saying that it's not, it's not um, uh, that it's a walk in the park, it's not, right? But it kills like right now the estimates are 3.4%. And it's probably overestimated because of um, inaccurate surveillance, right? Like they have not tested everybody, right? Um, but it, it is nothing compared like to the uh, the percentage of, of individuals that actually die of HIV. Without treatment, right, the host immune system has proven to be completely ineffective against the HIV virus. And then seeing a little bit of an, like uh, ear warm for you guys to think there. If we are not allowing like these people to die, right, of HIV, what are we doing like for the continuation of the transmission of that? So like see like how you can actually like tweak that and start thinking like some something that is radical and like incorrect to say like hey then all die. You know? Yeah, let it take its course, let them all die and eventually you will thin the herd and you have individuals that are resistant to that. But guess what? Like this is immoral if you do that, right? Uh, because you don't want like your loved one to die, so we actually have to take good care of it, right? And on top of that, like we are so good now at actually preventing HIV from transmitting like from one person to the next. The drugs now are so good for that that you can have HIV and have a regular partner, and just take like the the medicine, and your chance of getting that like they're they're close to none, given a certain uh, set of precautions, right? It's not that like. Um, you should like not care about it, right? Um, so the counterattacks of the host immune system may determine how good like the parasite can move from one species to the next. So vectors, right? We said that vectors are these organisms that, is a, that disperse the parasite between hosts, right? Sometimes what I, what I actually have is a vector using it being a parasite itself. Ticks are a good example of that. Ticks are a type of Ectoparasite, but at the same time, they carry Lyme disease within them. So this is like a parasite that doubles as a vector, right? There are many tick-borne diseases that we have to worry about. Lyme disease is just one of them, right? So Lyme disease has a very interesting life cycle. Like in here, like I can show like how the uh, the 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 the, many, the multi steps of the life cycle. So um, let's start like with um, uh, in the winter time here, let's start like right here, right? So in the winter time, like a tick like bites a, a deer and then it needs that blood meal to actually be able to lay the eggs. Without that blood meal, it doesn't have enough resources to lay the eggs, right? So uh, you're gonna see that they're like the steps on a on the cycle of a tick are uh, depend on blood meals, right? So these ticks acquire like the blood meal and then they finally are able to lay eggs. Ticks actually like hatch from the eggs, and at that point, uh, we call them larval ticks, right? Baby ticks, right? 
and these baby ticks cannot pierce like through the skin of um, big animals, right? Uh, what they actually can do is actually attack like two small rodents, right? And the rodents here are acting as the reservoir species, right? The reservoir species of this bacteria called Borella burgdorferii. Ooh, huge mouthful there. It's the bacteria that actually cause Lyme disease, right? Once they acquire that blood mew, it can molt like change its skin and grow to the next stage of its life, right? You went from baby tick to teenager tick, and teenager ticks get the name of nymphs, right? And then with that blood mew, they can survive the fall and the winter, right? And then and they overwinter under the leaves, and eventually they can actually like bite onto other things now, to dogs, the birds, to humans, and at that point then, this bacteria can infect the host, right? So, and that's a big problem. There's another, like, um, there's another, no, 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 there's actually several uh, emerging tick-borne diseases because these guys becoming so prevalent and these guys are becoming prevalent too because we remove predators. They were having, like, emerging tick-borne diseases, like, uh, yearly. Each year there's, like, a new one. Okay. So, here's a work that I did on actually that, right? Um, this is, like, part of my PhD. I actually was studying this invasive honeysuckle in the Midwest. Like this thicket that you see here in this picture here, you cannot see across because it's invaded by this shrub that is called honeysuckle, right? And I'm going to link these honeysuckles with ticks now, right? When I started this study, like uh, I, uh, talking to hunters in Missouri, they, the first thing they told me is that like when I told them that I was investigating honeysuckle, the first thing they tell me like, oh yeah, deer, deer loves to be underneath honeysuckle. Like, so the hunters actually knew it already. That honeysuckle was harboring like deer during like the hot summer midday like this thicket here that is impenetrable to us for deer this is like oh this is shady and cozy and nobody's gonna see me here so i'm gonna take a nap so um so okay so but i could not take the word of the hunters and then assume that that's what was happening i actually had to investigate that so here's what i had to do right I had to go like to plots that had honeysuckle, right? And plots that have like native plants. This honeysuckle is invasive. It's Asian honeysuckle or Tartaric honeysuckle, right? So, and I had like to count deer there. So there are two ways to do it. One is to put a camera trap there and count the deer. Or the other one is to do an indirect count of activity, right? I just count dung clusters per plot. Like by simply counting deer poop in these plots, I could tell how often deer were using the plots. And the comparisons were actually striking, right? Plots that are, have like honeysuckle, right? Plots that have honeysuckle have like almost three times as much, two and a half times as much like uh, deer dung than plots without it, right? And more importantly, if you look at another graph right here, right? If you look at the other graph here, you're going to see that like the amount of deer dung on plots that the honeysuckle was left intact, that I did not cut them off, right, is much higher than in plots in which I removed the honeysuckles. The experiment was essentially that, right? What happens with the amount of, um, of deer activity if I remove the honeysuckle, if I come here and eliminate that shrub? So I see there's like a severe uh, drop in the uh, activity of deer, right? And then I can actually now count the number of ticks on those plots. And it's not shown in this graph here. The number of ticks is like um, four times, um, no, like twice as high in areas with honeysuckle or in areas with honeysuckle intact, right? In plots that are honeysuckle is naturally occurring, I have like a huge concentration of ticks. And if I remove the honeysuckle or if honeysuckle has not invaded that yet, I would have a small quantity of ticks. The graphs don't show that, right? So the graphs here just show like something else, right? I figured out that there are more ticks once like there's honeysuckle and deer, right? But I, what I wanted to do now is to find out if these ticks were more infected, more infected with a bacteria. The bacteria that I chose was Elichiosis chafensis here. Um, why didn't you choose Lyme disease battle? Because I was doing this study in St. Louis and Lyme disease did not occur there back then, right? But it's, the mechanism is the same, you know? So how did I do it? Um, I partnered up with like some physicians like um, uh, 
at G Barnes and Jewish Hospital in St. Louis, like Dr. Storch and Dr. Tack, that they have like a DNA probe for ehrlichiosis, and that DNA probe like uh, will cling like to uh, ticks that are carrying that. How did they get that? Remember, like the reservoir species in this case here is the tick, all right? So uh, the tick, no, like the the the, the mice, right? And then, but I wanted to measure if the number of nymphs, like infected, like with ehrlichiosis, were more prevalent in the presence of the honeysuckle. And so I'm just basically comparing like this bar with this bar here. And you don't have to be a genius to figure out that there's a lot more infection like going on in plots of honeysuckle. And on top of that, if I remove the honeysuckle, this other graph right here, if I remove the honeysuckle, I can also cause a like depletion on that tree. Why is that bar here not as high as that one here? Probably because of my own interference on the plots. I was walking through these plots and these ones here I was not. They were naturally occurring and here I was like doing surveillance on these plots, right? Here I was doing surveillance on these plots, right? So that probably reduced the number of infected um, nymphs there, right? But it, it's an interesting result because like it tells you that if you want to find um, uh, tick-borne diseases, one of the things you can actually do is just remove the things that are making the life of the vectors and reservoirs like better, and that's honeysuckle, right? So, uh, and honestly, I think it's like a lot cheaper to take care of the, the invasive plant than treat people. So, parasite and host populations commonly fluctuate in regular cycles, right? Uh, and this is the part that I wish we'd spend more, mm, a little bit more time because you can go into the nuts and bolts of that by studying the math of it. So, we're, we're not going to do that. Um, but population fluctuations in nature like are common for parasites, right? Um, so, uh, like, get, get this example of these forest tent caterpillars, which are these caterpillars that can completely defoliate an entire oak tree. Like, it's a, it's a, uh, a very lethal caterpillar. Like, it's, it's naturally occurring here, but, like, some trees can actually go completely dead. Uh, they, they are always present, but their population will cycle every 10 to 15 years, right? Every 10 to 15 years, you're going to see massive defoliation of these oaks caused by these forest and caterpillars. So it, it, it's just a part of the natural cycle. The same way you have a natural a predator and prey cycle, you're going to have that for um, uh, parasites and hosts, right? So here's like following like the outbreaks of the three different sites on the defoliation intensity. And you see that every 10 to 15 years, there's a peak like there's a massive peak like on the on the amount of defoliation that you have some years like a lot worse than other ones right but oscillating it so so uh, one of the things that actually interfere with the the parasite host population dynamics is um, the ability of the uh, the host to develop like a certain resistance towards the parasite. So when I develop a resistance, it that means that my immune system can prevent like uh, myself from getting the host again. So resistance is actually a, a really good thing, you know, like that you can actually fight off the parasite by just becoming completely immune to that. But it's not the only way you can actually fight off a parasite. One of the other ways, like in the long term, right, like. One of the other ways that you can actually do is by infection tolerance, right? Many times, like if lived like long enough, what actually happens is that the effects of the um, uh, of the parasite on the host are minimized and then cause like very little harm to that, right? But it it, it sounds like initially initially it sounds like the tolerance is a good thing, but it's not necessarily bulletproof. Once you develop tolerance, that means that you guarantee that that host that the parasite will be prevalent in the population for the long term, right? Because you have that and then like it's not doing any harm. If I get each one of people's nose in that class, like I'm going to find out that all of you have developed a certain tolerance to a certain uh, streptococcus pneumoniae that is present on your, on your nose, right? That is not doing any harm to you, right? It's just when you get a strain that actually is bad to you, right? A different like variant of that streptococcus pneumonia, then you develop like a sore throat, right? So, and one of the ways you can actually modulate the resistance of, of parasites is actually through vaccinations, right? 
and right off the bat, so like I, I know that some people are going to say the vaccines cause autism. This is hogwash. There's just no other way to put it. The study that actually said the vaccines cause autism is based on a sample size of 12 people only, right? So, and 12 people is just simply not enough. So, vaccinations are a very effective way like to control resistance. Like, and then um, one of the things that I actually like that, that I like to mention is this: like how how good vaccines can be, right? There is a disease that is called smallpox. There was a disease that was called smallpox because what actually happened with smallpox is that we eradicated smallpox from the from the world, right? It's the one extinction that like um, that we have, like that that uh, that was extinct, that was eradicated via a vaccination um, uh, program, right? And smallpox had like, was very, very, very lethal, lethal, right? For certain strains, like you're talking about like a 3% mortality for uh, coronavirus, for certain strains of smallpox, the mortality was 80%, right? Uh, this disease single-handed was responsible for one third of the world blindness worldwide. And on top of this, like it could like um, kill like um, uh, uh, eighty percent of children that actually got it, right? And it's, it, it's terrible, like it's terrible, 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 terrible disease. The last case of smallpox in the world though was 1978. 1978, right? A vaccination program got rid of the, that. If coronavirus becomes like as bad as people think that it will be, a vaccine of that will be a no-brainer, and people are just gonna jump in the board because nobody wants to die, right? So it's always a matter of like vaccines. Or it's always a matter of like um, risks and benefits, right? The vaccines do have some effects. Some of them vaccines can cause seizures, right? Um, the one seizure is nothing. People are afraid of seizures. Seizures look ugly, but one seizure doesn't necessarily like compromise your neurological function like forever, right? But then if it's a small chance of getting the seizure and a hard uh, and a high chance of getting like a, a bad disease with even worse effects than the side effects of the vaccine, it's a no brainer. So it's on a case by case ba basis, right? Some of the vaccines can be extremely effective, right? So here's a, like a, one example here. So this is like the uh, measles, right? A true airborne disease, right? The, the COVID-19 is actually transmitted like through droplets, this one is truly airborne. If somebody walks in the room, then everybody in the room will immediately be um, contaminated by this and can potentially get the disease, right? Sim simply by breathing the same air. I don't have to cough, but I just breathe the same air. And this like killed a bunch of people, right? And, um, and you can see that this actually uh, oscillates quite a bit, right? There was like a worse time when like, this was actually like a time of the year that is actually worse, and a time of the year that is actually not so bad, right? So, uh, and just like a fun fact here, uh, it didn't kill rich like the same way that it killed the poor in the United States, because the rich people had plantation homes, and what they would do is that they would take their kids to plantation homes during the peak of the season, and then like protect their kids by simply having the resources to protect them, right? So, um, the vaccination program starts right here and look as soon as they start there's a huge spike on the cases right surveillance increases and then over time the vaccination program has actually tampered like measles quite a bit right to the point that oh, actually this is one of the disease targets for uh, eradication measles occurs in humans only so if you vaccinate everybody you could potentially get rid of measles worldwide right fun side story right measles is related to Bin Laden, like there's a really s s weird side note here that I, that I have to tell you about it. So uh, measles was actually on track to be eradicated. And then um, when they killed Bin Laden, they actually had to confirm who he was and what they actually did. They had to get blood samples of whoever was living in that uh, compound where he was hiding in Abbottabad in, in um, Pakistan. So once the CIA used like uh, to, to do that, like they pretended like what they did is that they pretended to be vaccination uh, vaccine agents to get the blood samples of the children living in that compound. And through a DNA test, they were able to match like that this person was related to one of the cousins of Bin Laden. And they figured out like, hey, indeed, this is Bin Laden living inside here. But the fact that the CIA used this um, 
covert as, as uh, vaccination agents, right? Um, created like a lot of like turmoil there. And now people are worried that when you're getting a vaccine in Afghanistan and Pakistan, you're actually being like blood sampled by the CIA. And that like pushed back like the eradication strategy for that. Um, so, uh, but in the United States, we'd like, through vaccinations, like measles has like decreased substantially, but in recent years, because of non-vaccination, we're seeing an increase on that too. Okay, so parasites have evolved like offensive strategies, whereas hosts have evolved defensive strategies. Hey, you to each their own, right? To each their own. If you're a host, your best, best strategy is to develop like a way to fight off the parasite. But if you're a parasite, like your best way is just to evolve like a way to become a better parasite, right? So the parasite adaptations are many, right? They can be like simple, like uh, behavioral, right? So um, we saw that snail on the beginning of the lecture that actually changes the brain of the slug, but it, it's changing the behavior of the host may be the key. On this example here, I have these flies, right? That get infected by a fungus and that fungus will actually turn the, the fly into a zombie too. Flies normally like, um, um, uh, like land on the top of the, the leaf, but here they actually will be on the upside down of the leaf, right? So on the under part of the leaf, and then like as these fly, infected flies die on that side, they create like a rain of spores over the flies that are landing on top of the leaf on the lower vegetation. So the zombie fly goes to a higher ground and lands differently than the other one. A simple behavioral change of the mind of the fly guarantees the transmission of the fungus, right? So how does that happen? How, how does that come to be, you know? This happens chemically. The parasite has to produce certain chemicals that will change the behavior of that fly. Think about that. Think about the implications of that, right? Do we have that? Hey, kind of, right? There's some new evidence showing that the bacteria that we have on our guts produce certain chemicals that will change our mood. So people are waiting for a zombie uh, apocalypse and we may be already be zombies of bacteria in a certain way. And here's another like example of uh, parasite adaptations. This isopod that I have right here, isopod is a relative of shrimp gets uh, infected with a parasitic worm called Atkantocephalus. But this worm requires like, at least two isopod, uh, at least two hosts, like an isopod and the fish to be infected. So the worm that actually is inside this guy here has like to complete, to complete its life cycle, he has to infect also a fish that will come, eat that isopod, and then infect the fish, and the cycle repeats. Like, uh, so uh, but he has to have these two hosts, right? But what is interesting is that, like, what, um, uh, <coughs> is, is how, like, this actually changes the mentality of the, the isopod. The isopods that are not parasitized, they know to assess risk really well. If there is zero fish, then they spend, like, roughly 70% of their time uh, under cover. So they spend like 70% of their time on their cover. Like if there's one fish, they spend about 80% and there's like two fish, more than 95% of their time they spend on their cover. So these guys, once they don't have the warrant, they know how to assess the risk of predation and then do something to protect themselves. However, if they have the worm inside them, they lose the ability to distinguish that risk. So these three bars here show you that like how much time they spend on their cover if they have the worm and what actually happens then is this is that the worm like like removes the senses the the judgment of this guy um and then gets more exposed right so it's another parasitic adaptation to change the mentality like the mindset of of the host right it turn into a zombie basically so the hosts have developed like a range of response to combat the parasites. If the parasites can like develop like a bunch of adaptations to toward the, the, the defense of the host, the hosts try to respond to that. They try the immune defenses. Like the immune system is a very good way to fight off parasites, right? Trying like to come up with a memory that can actually prevent you from having recurring infections. 
production of antibacterial and antifungal compounds, right? We do some of that. Your skin has some antibacterial compounds. Your tears have some antibacterial compounds. But even like um, the presence of antibodies, antibodies are is a back, antibacterial compound, if you may, right? It's part of the immune system, but it's a chemical that binds with the parasite and then fights it off, right? And if you cannot do that, then mechanical and biomechanical uh, biochemical defenses, right? Your skin has these biochemical defenses. Your skin itself is a mechanical adaptation. If you have a, like um, uh, a bruise and uh, your screen, skin breaks off, you are more prone to get an infection there, right? Another one adaptation that uh, hosts will have is self-medication. Like, and this is not exclusive to humans. These guys here eat like these aspidia leaves right here. Like these monkeys are eating these aspidia leaves. And if you look at the, the, the aspidia leaf in detail, you're going to notice that they're not like smooth. They're actually like are very hairy. So what actually happens is that each one of these aspidias has like thousands of like little hairs here on the leaves. And these hairs actually have a specific morphology associated with them. If we zoomed in in these hairs, you notice that they actually are spear shaped. So they're, they're very like pointy, right? Very pointy. And then these uh, um, chimpanzees, they, they suffer with some um, uh, worms that occur in them, right? Um, so uh, these worms like that are these nematodes that are in their digestive tract, they get impaled by this uh, uh, trichomes, these hairs on the leaves. So literally like they are impaling nematodes with the hairs of a spilia. I'm going to put the nematode bleeding here so you guys understand that this nematode is dead, right? So self-medication, right? It's not the only example. So like, some like may eat vernonia plants which contain chemical compounds that eat kill parasites and many other vertebrates actually can do so. Know which plant to eat when to fight off the certain parasite. And then finally, one of my favorite topics in, in parasite ecology. This topic is coevolution. When two or more species continue to evolve in response to each other's evolution. We talk about coevolution before in this class. What we did is when we were covering like predator and prey, we said that like lions can adapt like to zebras and so on and so forth. But this is not any different for uh, parasite and host, right? And let me give you one good example of that. So in Australia, they had these um, invasive bunnies that were introduced there, and these, those are bad bunnies um, that because they are incredibly prevalent and they just cause like massive crop damage. So in order to control these guys, we try like to do or use a very specific biological control. And the biological control that you were using there is this myxoma virus right here. And it's a good biological control because it's specific to the bunnies. So you wouldn't spill out loud like to other uh, organism at least not wouldn't that, that do that easily and it was so effective that it actually killed 99.8 percent of the bunnies right and then what actually happened then is that like 0.2 percent of the bunnies survived right so these favored the resistant bunnies and then the parasite like over time became less lethal like uh to the bunny population so um, what is actually happening here is a good example of coevolution, right? We can actually graph that. So here's what's actually graphing. So this is the number of myxoma epidemics, the number of myxoma epidemics that the bunny population experienced. So like from zero to seven ones. And you can see that initially, like the rapid mortality is very high, but the more epidemics I have, the virus becomes less, less, lethal over time the graph doesn't show it but i can expect that the like the the number of bunnies here or rabbits right to behave the following way like a huge number of bunnies and they're severely decreased after they exposed the first like um uh batches of that virus but over time these bunnies are expected to rise again right and that's essentially what actually happens in Australia, the bunnies rebounded after that. They co-evolved with these uh, new viruses and then eventually became more uh, tolerant of that. Uh, is that the bunnies only? Mm, probably a combo of both, right? 
all the viruses that were fairly lethal, right? All the virus strains that were fairly lethal also disappeared because there were no bunnies that allowed to infect after that. And the bunnies that were very susceptible also disappeared, right? It's a combo of both, right? So how does evolution affect the relationship between hosts and parasites? Parasites evolve from to form a symbiotic relationship. Uh, it can, it can, right? It doesn't have to, but it can, right? The parasites not only have, they cannot evolve to form a symbiotic relationship, but they can many times. How so? You just become more and more and more tolerant of that and eventually you become like a friend of the host, right? And you become a symbiotic one, but it doesn't have to be that way, right? Uh, it's not certain that it's gonna do that. Parasites become more able to transmit other species. Parasites become more able to transmit other species. Uh, it can happen. The longer you stay in a host, like the more likely, the more chance you have to spill over to another one. But like, it doesn't have to be that way. So this is kind of right, but it doesn't have to be that way. Parasites prevent other species from competing in the same niche. Parasites indeed do that. As they curb populations uh, of the host down, like you favor like other species to compete. Like let's say that like um, in the case of COVID-19, if COVID-19 took the entire human race and we compete with chimpanzees, chimpanzees will have like, hey, that was a good thing for us, right? So, but it, this is not this is not coevolution, right? This is just like a effects of competition, right? So this is not a good option, but we can say for certainty, with certainty that parasites become less deadly over time. Indeed, that's what just, that graph just showed you, right? Over time, the bunnies became less and less affected by the parasites. And finally, what practice increased the spread of med cow disease? This is an easy answer here. Adding dead cows to cow feed, right? So what actually happened is that we fed the cows with the bones that had pre on them, and those bones actually cause other cows to die of med cow disease. So that's it for this lecture today.